Hello, everybody. It's too nice to see you all. I'm Carrie from HBD. I am Marson from HBD. Welcome to the HBD webinar. Explore the potential of medical applications of AM. Before we start our webinar, I want to remind our audiences that this webinar is intended exclusively for additive manufacturing and medical applications, uh, and it must only be available to certain professionals. Today, our European host is Mr. Martin. Welcome, Mr. Martin. Welcome. Hi. Uh, hi, Marston. Hi, Kerry. Um, thanks for your introduction. And thanks everybody for your time to attend this uh, webinar. So my name is Martin. I'm the head of sales uh, for iMaker France. iMaker, we are a distributor of additive manufacturing equipment. We are located uh, in uh, in France, in Paris. We have an office in uh, New York, another office in London, and um, we are also we also have an office in Copenhagen. Um, we offer additive manufacturing equipment, uh, which include obviously a uh, SLM printer from uh, HBD. So today we'll talk about the potential of um, metal additive manufacturing for medical application. During our online sharing, all the participants could text your question to the message box, and we will answer the, the question online. So to begin with, let's take a look on uh, who we are going to see today. So first, uh, let's welcome uh, Mr. Rui Coelho. Um, he has been uh, working in implantology field for over 20 years and is experienced in 3D printing maxillofacial implants. He will deliver the lecture aiming to show all the process needed to ensure patient safety while using um, medical 3D implants. So now let me give you uh, Mr. Rui Coelho. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks. Um... Niklas for your invitation uh, and thanks to HPT. Uh, the reason I think I was invited to make this um, uh, lecture is because uh, we use uh, HPT machines on, uh, on our process of manufacturing medical devices. So <clears throat> medical devices, most of all, they need a biological design they need to be made it's not just a question of printing but printing it's a very important point the two most important things that we have to look on a project and we every time we do a case we call, we call it as a project so the first one is the scope the second one is stakeholders and what about if my project was to construct a kids playground so i would need the kids as this would be my stakeholders, the kids, the engineer and the architect. <clears throat> and the engineer probably will design it like this. And the architect will probably design it like this, more place it inside the environment. But in the end, the kid will look at it like this. So this is what you would desi uh, desire. So, uh, we like to value uh, the weight of uh, each stakeholder, and for now, for us, in this case, we would take about 50% of the, of the kids. Second, uh, we would take 45% of the of the architect, and only 5% would go for the engineer. But if my project was to treat someone in a, with a cancer and make him a um, medical device, I would need the patient, I would need the engineer, and I would need the, the surgeon. And probably the engineer would see it like this. The surgeon will always be very concerned about the anatomy and dynamics, but the patient in reality, he just wants to be like this. So for me, it's always to consider as 50% about the patient, 45% of the surgeon, and only 5% of the engineer. So when we are doing medical device, should we mimetize what we see? And uh, what about taking in consideration all the environment that we are going to put? So we need to know what are the anatomy. It's not just to mimetize, to make uh, on, um, on metal something that exists on bone, 
but uh, we need to do what we call uh, um, biological design is that we need to know there is a capsule, there is muscles that have to be inside the prosthesis, otherwise it will fail the, the, um, the rehabilitation. In our workflow, I would like to involve always my engineers with photos of patients, and uh, we always like to be less invasive. Uh, we need to decide what material to use. We are trying to prototyping and trying to do our best. And for that, we just have to evolve with our patient. So every time we are going to treat someone, I always show to my engineers of designing and manufacturing who is the person behind. So they need to be um, engaged with this. So we need to know the patient and they need to know that each one will be uh, responsible for the end. So um, what, what, metal, what should we uh, um, choose as material? Um, uh, we always uh, try to prototype our devices in order to, when we look at it, it's always different to look at uh, on, the, um, on the end or to look at on the, um, the screen. So it is important also to understand to be less invasive. For example, this patient was uh, considered to make a big surgery and just with a small implant, we could change completely his face. And by being less invasive, we could give back his life. So lessons learning that uh, something that we should do always uh, on a project, we should design a process where the experience of all these and uh, all the designs could benefit in new designs. What does this mean? This uh, means that uh, we, we always make a big family here about surgeons to discuss themselves to try to get better and better. And always remember our goal is the patient. Uh, but are medical printed devices safety for patient? This is very, very important. It's not just because we have a machine that we can place implants inside the patient. So there was a uh, long time ago, um, FDA started with uh, the control of medical devices. And um, the truth is that... Um, we never know, uh, we always know about uh, drugs and we have lots of uh, feedbacks about drugs because drugs, uh, you can measure completely the effect of it. But about medical devices, we always have uh, the factor that the surgeon, uh, the technical surgery could have uh, something to do with it. Uh, so, we need regulation for this, and uh, FDA only started in 1990, and it was because of this. Uh, in in the early um, in the early 80s, um, there was uh, new medical devices for changing uh, the disc on the um, on the condyle. And uh, several patients in the United States who was operated with this, they received this implant. And uh, some years after, they all left to take it out because we saw this Teflon uh, implant was reacting and giving giant cell reaction. So when, but still nowadays there are people that are still doing this. This is a cast titanium frame implant for, for making a, um, an implant. Uh, what we have to do about medical devices that we have to evaluate it chemical, we have to evaluate the biocompatibility and we also have to evaluate it mechanical. So for that, we do on our medical devices, lots of SEM, uh, electron microscopy to see the surface. Also, we try to see the core. We do mechanical characterizations, either of our machines. And uh, when we are doing the, we got ISOs. It's not when we are talking about printing, it's not only printing because there is different um, behaviors if you print outside of the plate or if you print it in the middle. Also, there are different behaviors if you print it 
vertically, horizontally, or if you print it, 45 degrees. So besides material, we also need to prove that our design will be uh, evaluated from the mechanical point of view. And uh, for that, we need to do all this FEA, finite element analysis of our design. And we do this for each medical device that we design for each patient, we do this. Biocompatibility, it's very important. It's not enough just to say that it's titanium grade five or titanium grade 23, and this is compatible with, um, with, uh, with a medical device. The question is that uh, by changing it, by um, preparing it and all post-processing, we can uh, change the quality of this titanium, we can contaminate it either the core or the surface. And this uh, medical device can be no longer biocompatibility, okay? Can have no longer biocompatibility. We use our medical devices inside clean rooms. We do lots of cleaning surface, uh, also in controlled environments. So clean rooms are very, very important. And there are clean rooms for each material, not to have contamination with several materials on different devices. Uh, also, it is very important to understand that the, the sterilization has to be a, a controlled process. Uh, the cleaning is to ensure that the amount of bacteria present, it will be uh, lower than a certain level that sterilization will be effective. So also it's not like sending for being sterilized on the, uh, on the office because uh, autoclaves are not good for um, making sterilization of medical devices. Why? Because it will have contact with water and this water will contaminate the surface of the implant. So printed titanium has given us a lot of choices nowadays, and we can be much more biological on our design. So being able to do complex geometries like meshes that allows that tissue stays in the middle and contact with the tissue, tissue on the other side, uh, it is big, big, big uh, um, e evolving on, uh, on designing of this kind of medical devices. Also, it is very, very strong material, allow us to uh, load it without uh, having any problems. So printed titanium, it's the ideal material when we are going to load uh, this kind of implants. Uh, we can do thin and um, very strong implants. And this could uh, help us by um, reconstructing all the face, uh, cranium, and also where people don't have enough bone for placing uh, standard implants, we can do also individualized implants based on uh, plates uh, that we screw it on the bone, like we do, for example, for fractures. But instead of reducing fractures, what we are doing is that we connect them to a dental implant and this dental implant will receive the prosthesis. Uh, and we can do this either for the maxilla or the mandible. Uh, and the principle is the same. We just use the places where we use, where you, Usually we put our plates and screws or osteosynthesis, and then we just add a small implant that stay, that will fix, uh, screw fix the dental rehabilitation. As you can see here as an example, and how it stays on the end and on these points, then we can screw prosthesis and giving um, quality of life back. The same for the inferior. This is a case of uh, dental implants that have been lost for infection and there is no bone anymore to replacing new implants. So we decided to make this implant. 
And on the end, what you see is that we got these small cones where we can make impressions and then we can screw teeth for um, rehabilitation. Also, it is very important dynamics because we need to identify all the muscles and the muscles have to pass through the prosthesis to be involved with it. So our company has now 2,412 medical devices placed in patients. And this is a result, I'm sorry, but this is a result for 2021. We didn't have yet, I think we are around 3,500, but this is a, the result of 2021. So in resume, uh, design, design, you need to understand that it's not an engineering thing. It's something that we have to take care of the patient, uh, we have to take care of the surgeon, and also engineering. Safety is that uh, you need to understand that it's not just a question of printing, it's a question of making something that will be accepted and will not harm the patient. And secondly, we should reporting. Report, it's very important for us to evolve. And uh, this is something that we need for uh, having better and better medical devices. Also, I would like to remember that uh, this is not an implant from a company. This is an implant from the surgeons. They will always actively be involved in the whole process to give a better result for their patients. Thank you and I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for your sharing, uh, Dr. Rui Coelho. That's really impressive. Um, now let's welcome Mrs. Um, Christina from uh, Sino Euro Material Technology Company. Um, she will share with us a knowledge about metal powder applied in medical implants. Christina is specialized in plasma rotating electrode process with um, titanium pre-alloy powder and hot isostatic pressing for titanium components. She will also introduce a new material that can be applied in medical implant. Let's welcome uh, Christina. Hello everyone, I'm Christina, International Marketing Manager from Sino Euro Materials Technologies, brief as Sino Euro. I'm honored to be here to be invited by HBD to share my point of view about titanium-6 aluminum-4 vanadium and titanium-6 aluminum-7 niobium powder application in orthopedics and dental industry. This page is a brief introduction about the company. Sino Euro is located in Xi'an, central part of China, also well known because of the terracotta warriors. Sino Euro is subsidiary to Northwest Institute for Non Ferrous Group, short as NING Group. Starting from 2013, Sino Euro now has more than 100 official employees. The total five workshops display the whole production line from titanium ingot melting all the way to the SS prep, spherical powder, and hot isostatic pressing billet manufacturing. And to be continued is the introduction of Sino Euros powder manufacturing method. The process is called SS prep, explained as Superm speed plasma rotating electrode process. It's a method for producing metal powders where the end of a metal bar is melted by plasma while it is rotated about its longitudinal axis. Molten metal is centrifugally ejected and forms droplets which solidify to spherical powder particles. Compared with the traditional prep, SS prep could fit bigger diameter electrode and has extreme rotating speed, about 33,000 RPM, resulting in a better yield of powder for selective laser melting application. The chamber is sealed with argon gas, and the powder produced by SS prep 
process present great flowability and less hollow particles. Sino Ura is certified by ISO 1345, which means Sino Ura's products are qualified for the medical devices industries. In 2021, the company's total sales of titanium 64 powder are 50 tons, in which around 10 tons are used in selective laser melting application while the rest are for powder metallurgy. The five line charts display the 20 different batches of Thai 64 powder size 15 to 53 microns. The good powder batch st stability guarantees the smooth printing process and stable mechanical properties of printing pads. The maximum quantity of one batch is 1,000 kilograms. Thai 64 owns good mechanical, chemical, and biological properties. This page shows the application cases in dental industry. In terms of biosafety and corrosion resistance, Thai 64 has a great advantage compared with stainless steel or cobalt alloys. The titanium crown and bridge are friendly to people with allergies. The lightweight also offer the comfortable experience to the patient. What's more, the patients don't need to remove the crown or the bridge during MRI because titanium has no magnetic characteristics, which could save precious time during the emergency. In China, the powder needs to be qualified by National Medical Products Administration before production and sale in dental industry. Sino Euro currently has an MPA's approval for both its Thai 64 and Cobalt Chromium Molybdenum powder. Thai 64 is widely applied in orthopedic implants, such as spine cages and hip cups. The American company Osus Fusion System, using selective laser melting to print interbody fusion cage. So does the the Pure Senses company. Uh, it's part of the Johnson Johnson families of companies. The implant porosity is increased to 80% and the pore size is around 700 microns. And here on the left side, the AK Medical Holding Limited is the largest 3D printing medical devices manufacturers by using electron beam melting process. And the well Yi medical device successfully using SOM to print hip cup in 2022 and also got approval from the NMPA. Titanium-6 aluminum-7 niobium alloy, also referred as TC-20 in China. So to make it easy, I will call it as TC-20 afterwards. So TC-20 is a titanium alloy, consists of alpha and beta phases, similarly as Thai-64 alloy. Niobium was used as an alloying element to replace the toxic reacting element vanadium in Thai-64 alloy. At the same time, niobium has high hardness, corrosion resistance, good ductility, and chemical stability. All those properties make TC-20 alloy to be a high-strength biomedical alloy, plus its elastic modulus is very close to human bone tissue. Hundreds of clinical experimental results show that TC20 have excessively curative effect. However, it hasn't been widely used due to the expensive niobium element and the relatively high production cost. Wuhan Yijiabo Biological Materials is the first company in China using TC20 alloy as the implant material. The two pictures present the octabular cup and femoral stem made of TC20. 
or moving on to HIP service and component. So hot isostatic pressing service is Sinoeura's new business section. And this picture gives a general idea about the entire process. First step is designing and manufacturing the capsule. Then filling the acid spray powder and degassing. Remove the capsule after electron welding, HIP, and heat treatment. Machining is the final step. After this, HIP billet or near knit shaping part could be got. From table 1 and uh, the EBSD analysis of the HIP TIE 64 bar, we could say the bar contains an excellent combination of toughness and strength. Isotropic mechanical properties makes the bar easy to process during the downstream application, such as implant. And its mechanical properties and corrosion resistance are not less than forged products. So, the, by the most important of all, the excellent fracture toughness could significantly enhance the material's long term service. And here is the end. Thank you very much for your time, for sitting through the presentation. Have a lovely day. Bye. Thanks for your wonderful presentation, Christina. Now let's welcome Ms. Emily Urban from Hyperganic Company to present how the software works for medical implants along with 3D printers. She studied engineering at the Technical University of Munich and the Coffee Institute at Technical University of Delft with a specialization towards medical engineering in her master's. As a PhD student in bioprinting at Technical University of Munich, she studied and improved the macro printing workflows towards clinically relevant scaffolds. Hi, Emily. Um, I'm super happy to um, show you what we're doing here at Hyperganic. Um, really quick to myself, so I studied mechanical engineering um, and then decided to go for a PhD in bioprinting and I'm now here in business development at Hyperganic. So what we essentially do here is we use code and algorithms to create physical objects mainly for 3D printing. Um, and there are several reasons why we're doing that. Um, one of them is just the speed that algorithms have. Um, so you can basically um, create objects much faster and you scale with computing power, not so much with manual work um, in front of the screen in, in a CAD program. Um, and as soon as you set that algorithm uh, up that designs an object, um, you can basically design 10, 100,000 variants of the same object and you can test them or you can use simulation um, to see how well your object behaves and you can optimize your objects essentially um, to get the, the design that you're looking for. Um, the next unique thing about using code and algorithms is that we, we're using an object-oriented coding language, meaning that uh, we derive functions um, for functionality, um, meaning that, for example, if you look at the alveoli, um, they are spanned with a vascular network um, that essentially uh, promotes the oxygen uptake from the air that we breathe in. Um, so we want um, a high surface area there so we can take up a lot of oxygen, right? And then if you look at a rocket engine, we have cooling channels, which essentially we also want um, a high surface area to get a lot of heat convections. Um, and so we, we have designed both of these objects using algorithmic engineering, um, and we've used the, the exact same function to design both the capillaries and the rocket engine. So you can see that uh, creating, creating functions, um, there's a lot of uh, cross-pollination, and you can oftentimes reuse and rework uh, your, your workflows um, for, for different applications. And last not, but not least, using algorithmic engineering, um, you know, everybody can work on the same project um, by creating functions, um, adding up to uh, a larger 
a mm. more complex object. Meaning that, you know, if one person leaves the company, he's not taking all that knowledge that he put into one single part with himself, um, but it's a more interdisciplinary work um, between people working on a single object. So what are we doing in the medical field? So the one thing that we're doing is latticing. So essentially infilling uh, given geometries with arbitrary unit cells, oftentimes for either bone uh, replacement or for implants. And by arbitrary unit cells, we really mean every single unit cell that you can imagine. You just need those distinct um, connection points that if you replicate the unit cell, that you get an interconnected network. Um, and in the medical field, it gets really interested when we start modulating these lattices, right? So if you look at um, a, a native bone, um, you have a very anisotropic material. So you have those trabecular um, that build up the, the inner part of the bone. Um, and, and they're to a certain extent random, um, but overall they're aligned. Um, to withstand the force from the main incoming force direction. So to be very strong um, when we jump and when we run. Uh, and so uh, we essentially can also modulate these lattices um, inside of our geometries. And we can either do that in a 2D way um, by overlaying the geometry with, uh, for example, with the grayscale heat, ma heat map like you see here. Um, and as a result, you have um, a gradient in the porosity depending on, on the radius in this case. We can, of course, also do that in a 3D manner. So by using 3D data like point clouds, we can influence uh, the beam thickness um, in the entire object. And because we're code-based, there's basically no limits to complexity. So we can do a lattice and a lattice and a lattice. And we can add a surface roughness, roughness to that as well. And the surface roughness can be locally um, because basically you scale with computing power, not with human work sitting in front of the screen and designing every single one of these objects. Um, and so what, what you see here are some of the more biological infill patterns using either stochastical lattices or Voronoi um, <clears throat> geometries. Um, and what you always see here is not just this one object, but essentially you see ten hundred thousands of objects because basically the algorithm designs the workflow um, and, and you can then personalize and customize it um, automatically. Uh, another important thing when we think of medical implants is, of course, validation, uh, seeing if, if it withstands the, the forces that will occur in the body. Um, and we do that using um, simulation. So we have a very unique um, FEM solver um, that can very quickly and efficiently uh, determine the displacement and the stresses that occur um, after implantation. And so I brought some examples of that here. So here we have a hip implant where we latticed um, the part that is integrated uh, into the bone. Um, and we use different infill patterns and different parameters, different um, pore sizes, basically. Um, and then we performed uh, a mechanical analysis over it. So what you see here in the colorful images um, is just the degree of stress that is occurring onto the implant at this location. Um, and you can very easily see that you know, some lattices or, or some parameters are um, probably going to work a bit better. Um, others have a lot of stress um, and might not be um, the, the appropriate ones. Um, and so we have an automatic workflow here of designing, you know, ten hundreds, thousands of variants and automatically performing simulation on each and every one of those. Um, and we can also choose, you know, different load cases. Um, and so that's a very, very important part of, of designing and optimizing an implant. And so the other thing that we can do is we can also create complex objects um, purely using code and algorithms. So what you see here are the alveoli that are spanned with a vascular network. So this is more from a bio uh, printing application. Um, and uh, this is purely derived by an algorithm, meaning that again, you're not just seeing this one alveoli, but you're seeing a lot of variations. Um, merely with a click, you can change the degree of vascularization, uh, you can change the wall thickness um, or the alveoli size, for example. And on top of that, you can use um, algorithmic engineering to also define different um, 
uh, materials, different colors, or even different mechanical properties if those correlate with, um, with the printing process. So we have um, a voxel engine, meaning that essentially the algorithm is painting matter into space, so it is defining where there is going to be uh, matter and, and where not. Um, meaning we're describing the whole volume. So essentially for each 3D pixel inside of our object, so for each voxel, um, we can define these different parameters. And so what you see here is that, you know, we've defined different materials for the different regions um, of the alveoli, having this red color for the, for the capillaries, and then having a, a blue um, color for, for the alveoli, and we even overlaid it with a um, gyroid pattern, um, just, to, just to demonstrate the, the capabilities here. Um, and another really uh, exciting um, example of this is um, a bone um, model uh, spanned with a, with a muscle um, that even goes over the tendons back to the bone. Um, so this is, of course, a very futuristic example. Um, this is not bio-printed yet, so we printed this um, with a Stratasys printer. Um, but essentially, again, you can see uh, to which extent you can replicate the complexity um, of nature, also of these organic, um, organic forms, basically, um, and how you can add different uh, color coding or property encoding into the algorithm um, so that when you print it, you have these uh, distinct um, materials. And here you can see basically the, the image slices um, that are going through the muscle and the bone. Um, and you just see that it's a refractive model of the muscle, basically going from a large fiber bundle and then going into smaller and smaller bundles. Um, so that was um, the presentation of Hyperganic. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I'm happy to hear and answer um, all of your questions. Okay, thanks, Amelie. Um, I really like your presentation. Um, now, if there is anyone having any question, please um, ask us and we will give answer online later at our um, question and answer part. Or you can text your question on the message box. So now, let's welcome um, Mr. Nicola from HBD to deliver a speech. Um, Nicola has a rich experience in SLM LPBF additive manufacturing technology and its industrial applications. He has helped numerous European companies to initiate additive manufacturing projects. In his speech, he will present us a blueprint of SLM LPBF technology for medical application with abundant case studies. Uh, hi, Nicolas. Hello, hello, dear audience, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your attention. My name is Nicholas Yao. My topic today is Metal 3D Printing Solutions for Medical Applications. Based on the HBD Laser Powder Back Fusion Additive Manufacturing Technology. Before I start, please note that this presentation is intended for medical related professionals only. Some of the photos are of such courses and may cause discomfort to non professionals. So if you have nothing to do with medical or additive manufacturing, or if you are underage, you are not supposed to be here. Well, the contents. We are about to discuss the market prayers, case studies of medical applications, materials for, med for metal 3D printing, and the machines. Part 1. Market prayers. The chart here lists the top 25 orthopedic companies in the world. We found that more than half of them have adopted metal AM technologies, and the applications are mainly for trauma, spine, and joint replacement. First on the list, as you can see, Stryker is known to have started 3D printing titanium implants since 2001. What attracts me most is that Isdectech has just um, announced two years ago to scale up the production of its stainless shoulder implant by switching from EBM to SOM. Uh, that's exactly the technology we are going to talk about. Certainly, there are more market players. Uh, let me ask you a question. Are you one of them? 
what are uh, what are the other uh, market players do you know? A type of answers in the chat room to enlighten me. But if you haven't started uh, using a metal 3D printer, maybe you are falling behind your peers. Now that we are here to discuss it, you are ha having a very good chance to catch up. According to the market reports, the global orthopedic implants in 3D printed medical devices markets will both grow at a tremendous speed in the following years. The latter, in particular, shown by the red bars in the graph, will grow at a faster rate and is expected to reach nearly 5 billion US dollars by 2026. This is a positive trend that you don't want to miss, isn't it? You might ask, why is this technology so, so popular with medical device man manufacturers? Uh, let's see how doctors help patients with 3D printed medical devices first. Here, I have chosen two case studies from the journals. In the pelvic tumor recession, doctors used 3D printed iliac prosthesis for the first time. A total of 35 patients accepted the 3D printed and the prosthesis. Researchers included that the use of 3D printed pelvic prosthesis was safe without additional complications. In Shanghai, doctors have cured hundreds of patients with ad additive manuf manufacturing technologies over the past decade. They concluded that the 3D printing technology had a good therapeutic effect on both complex and large bone defects. Part 2 Medical Applications I'd like to share here with uh, some more case studies with you. Take a look at these images first. These ports were printed on HBD machines. With uh, so many varieties, I'm afraid it's a little bit desert to everybody, isn't it? So tell me, which medical devices are most often 3D printed? Our answer is that we can generally classify the applications into three categories. Surgical tools, components of medical devices, and orthopedic implants. For implants, as shown in this uh, diagram here, from head to toe, 3D printed metal parts are contributed to dentistry, trauma, spine, and joint. Simulation technology plays an important role in the process from implant designing to 3D printing. The two animations show the relationship between the temperature change and the deformation stress of each layer of metal powder melting. Besides orthopedic implants, metal 3D printed surgery guides are also loved by doctors. We all know that everyone's bones are different, and it makes custom surgical guides important. In this case, a 44-year-old female patient was unfortunately diagnosed the tumor. We 3D printed the auxiliary osteotomy guide with a drilling a positioning guide and fixed rods for doctors to perform surgery. In another case, for a 56-year-old patient, we, we 3D printed surgical guide to assist doctors in the surgery of precision total knee replacement. We are pleased to say that all similar surgeries went very well last year. All the instruments are also 3D printed. This is a surgical electric trio positioning sleeve. It was designed by a doctor himself. It is so special in design that it is impossible to make it by traditional method. In addition, the use of titanium alloy is not only light in weight, reducing the fatigue during the uh, operation, but also brings forth high strength and reliable positioning. In the fight against COVID-19, our machine users print these anti-scatter grids in pure tungsten, which are used in CT scanners to improve the uh, imaging quality. 
a fleet of 20 30 hpd printers are uh, running their night to meet the needs of mass production of this part I'd like to quote Mr. Yu Jinye, the founder of HBD company. He once said, Over the years, we have been insisting on all the achievements of metal 3D printing technology in the field of medical devices, and are committed to translating doctors' knowledge into enterprise practice. Part 3 Materials the most used materials are titanium alloy, stainless steel, copper chrome alloy, pure tungsten, and tungsten. 3D printing medical devices usually takes into account the chemical uh, composition of the material and the uh, mechanical properties, physical properties, and microstructure of the printed parts. As a provider of additive manufacturing solutions, we use complete testing equipment in our testing laboratory. For an instance, a beam quality analyzer, tensile testing machine, rough, roughness tester, and so on. Here I'm taking titanium alloy as an example. We all know that titanium alloy has good biocompatibility. Moreover, we should take, make sure that the uh, 3D printed parts comply with relevant medical requirements. The criteria at this stage mainly include density of the printed parts, young modules, and the mechanical performance. For sure, the third party testing is essential. We printed the femoral stems in titanium for the purpose of standards formulation. A third party tested it and uh, proved that the load cycles reached 5 million times. Similar tests um, through third parties are also done by our customers in real work. In this case, an HBD machine user printed 1,500 units of dental implants. The fatigue strength test also reached 5 million times. A number of researchers um, uses the HBD um, metal 3D printers have published papers on the development of the material in journals like Science and Elsevier. These projects may not be designed for medical applications especially, but the uh, research methods and findings are informative. Part 4. Metal 3D Printers to do a great job, you need a great machine. Thus, we strongly recommend the three machine models for medical applications to you. The HBD150 has a circular forming platform with a diameter of 159mm. This printer is available in single laser and dual laser. HBD200 has a rectangular forming size of 270 by 170 mm in the XY direction. It is equipped with two lasers of 300 watts. HBD350, it is optional in one or two 500 watt lasers. The fabrication size is 325 by 325 by 400 mm. All of the three machines models are capable of printing high precision, high quality products with a minimum wall thickness of 0.1 mm and a typical accuracy of 25 microns. So which one do you like to buy? Let us know your choice by leaving a message in the chat room. Not sure if you know, but HBD metal 3D printers are indeed quite popular throughout of the world. Each red dot in this map indicates that an, an HBD machine is in use. We also capture some delivery and installation scenes as well as some happier moments with our customers and partners. We hope that you share your success and happiness with us too. Last, the conclusions. Before jumping to the conclusions, please take a look at this chart. It is an ISO STM standard structure. 
my presentation idea today is actually based on this uh, guideline covering uh, materials processes and machines as well as 3d printed parts for medical specific applications well let's make some conclusions uh, firstly metal 3d printing technology is adopted by more and more medical companies secondly medical applications cover instruments components surgical tools and orthopedic implants in the end if you want to learn more about the metal 3d printing for medical applications and medical uh, metal 3d printers welcome to contact hbd that's all thank you very much thanks for your sharing mr nicholas uh, now our four guests all finished their presentation it's time for questions and uh, answers uh, hi, Martin, could you please first? Yeah, uh, so the first question is, I think, for um, for Rui Coelho. Um, how many patients have you cured with um, um, metal tree printing technology? Uh, at this time, in this year already, or I went to see it's 3,500. Okay, wow, that's big. Yeah. Well, well done. Thank you. Okay, uh, I got a question. I think it's for Emily. Hi, Emily. Uh, how can simulation help to improve orthopedic implant design? Uh, yeah, very good question. Thank you. Um, so uh, we can we have a simulation technique that can very quickly uh, iterate and simulate uh, for mechanical stresses and also for deformation inside of the implants. Um, and so by doing that, especially combined with design, we can actually close the feedback loop, optimizing the, the design, the, the internal lattice structure, um, but also the overall design of the implants. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Amelie. Uh, I think the other question is for you, Christina, about uh, TI-64. Um, as far as we know, TI-64 grade uh, 23 is more widely used in medical implants uh, products. Could you briefly explain to us the advantages of characteristic of this powder compared uh, with um, other titanium alloy powders? Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. So I think uh, when the Huiz PPT also mines also uh, first answers this question, so when we speak of uh, the, the titanium alloy powder, so the fact is more than 80% is TI-64. So due to its very good physical and mechanical properties, and plus uh, the TI-64 is very cost effective compared with all other titanium based alloy. I think that's the reason. Thanks. Right, thanks uh, Christina. All right. Specialize the applications. Oh, oh sorry. I have a, got a question for Nicholas. How long has HBD specialized the applications of 3D printing in the field of orthopedic implants and bell defect repair? Thank you, Carrie. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'd like to say HBD uh, started to serve the medical sector as early as 10 years ago. In the early years, um, we, pre we printed um, many surgical guides and temporary processes, um, which were used in actual uh, medical uh, procedures. Um, for example, the uh, uh, femoral stems and uh, acetabulars. So um, with years of experience, we have developed 3D printing processes for a variety of medical products and materials. So um, if uh, uh, the audience, the, all, the, all of the friends, if you, you have any uh, demands, just let us know. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Uh, here I got a new question. I think it's for Dr. Rui Coelho. Uh, so, what advice do you have for medical doctors who are preparing to use metal 3D printing? Uh, well, the most important thing is to understand the behavior of uh, the, um, the metal um, with the rest, with the dynamics of the body. Um, 
I saw, for example, a very nice um, presentation about uh, creating uh, these um, structures that would uh, also integrate better, but um, it's mainly about uh, uh, orthopedics because when we are talking about cranial maxillofacial, we get very thin tissue and our main um, problem is the essences. Uh, the issues is it's the what we have uh, as the the most difficult challenge. So we need to understand very well. We need to have uh, uh, very good conversations with surgeons, showing them what <coughs> pardon, what are the limits of uh, the um, the the titanium, and uh, of course making some meshes to create muscle attachments and everything else and that's what's make uh, that's what will make the difference okay thanks uh thanks really for this uh, explanation um christina i have another question for you um with the, the continuous deepening of uh, meta reprinting technology and the popularization of its application what are the characteristics of the development trend of metal powder in the future? Um, so based on our customers' inquiry and orders, so we noticed that the tantalum powder are more and more popular in th these days. So the the parts of, uh, from our customers, so the parts printed uh, out of the tantalum powder has excellent biocompatibility biocompati with bone. So it doesn't need to be taken out after the implantation. Also, the elastic modulus of tantalum is especially suitable for bone. It's around the 70 GPA. Uh, so it's really suitable for bone replacement, joint replacement, and also human tissue fitting. So, so far, the tantalum powder is a, a human implant uh, material and doesn't find any adverse reactions so far. So I think this the the tantalum powder will be the next uh, popular materials in the future. Okay, okay thanks, thank uh, Christina. You, Christina again. I also got a question for Emily. How can an orthopedic implant design workflow be automated using algorithmic engineering? Yes. Um, so we basically can help the encode the laborious human driven engineering processes into computer algorithms um, to create basically customized and also also integrative implant designs for additive manufacturing. Um, so we can basically automate the whole process from taking uh, patient specific segmented CT scans uh, to production ready implants. Okay, thank you, Emily. Uh, here I got a new question. I think it's for Dr. Rui Coelho. Uh, this question is from Martin McMahon. Uh, his question is, how did you qualify the AM process for uh, medical and uh, pro medical machine manufacturers and yeah. the production for medical devices? Okay. Let's see, there is two things. Uh, one is that you have to qualify your method of manufacturing. So for that, you have to have uh, the powder inside clean rooms. You have to make from time to time tests to the sieving powder uh, to see if there is any change. You have to test uh, the contaminants of uh, the post-processing material. Also, you have to, and Nicholas already, answer to this question partially uh, by making uh, several uh, tests to characterize the density of your material. From beginning on that point, you can also do uh, FEA, um, finite element analysis, to understand if it will uh, get um, loading. Of course, uh, the most important things is, um, and um, taking on a defined from Nicholas, is that uh, printing is not the end material. We need also to do 
hybrid manufacturing or post-processing and in some places where we have to add the threads for screwing things we need to do hybrid manufacturing meaning that we print it and after we mill it so after all this uh, we need to take out our finish um, parts and we have to send it for biocompatibility analysis so in resume, you have to validate your process, you have to validate your product. OK, thank you, Dr. Rui. There is a question from Anna Paula for Christina. How close is the elastic modulus of this Type 6 AL7 MB alloy of bow tissue? Uh, so the the bone, human bone tissues uh, elex, uh, elastic property is around like 10 to 20 uh, GPA. This four is around 120. Um, while for the TC20, it's around 10, uh, 100. So it was around 20 GPA less than the common TC64. So it was more closer to the human bone tissue. But the only like the disadvantage of that material is the price is a little bit more expensive than Type 64. OK, thank you, Ms. Christina. Uh, I got a new question for Emily. Hi, Emily. Uh, what really differ differentiates Hypergenic from similar existing software already on the market? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So one thing that really differentiates us is uh, the simulation technology that we have. So uh, we have a simulation technique that is very novel and that doesn't involve meshing. Um, and so meshing is usually the part that takes the most time in a simulation process. So if you look at the implants, the hip implants that I've shown using traditional simulation technologies, it would take hours, if not even days, to just sim simulate one of these implants. Um, and using our technology, we can do that under in under 10 minutes. And so that basically allows us to look at a larger variation um, of, of implant designs um, to really optimize the, the design for the patient. OK, thank you, Ms. Emily. Uh, I got two new questions for Dr. Rui. The first one is, uh, we learned that your metal 3D printed products are so outstanding. So do you have plans to promote your products and services in other countries? This is the first one. Uh, well, um, we are present in Europe. We are present in Middle East. We are present in Southeast Asia with um, headquarters in Singapore. Uh, we are present in Brazil. We are now finishing um USA 510k and uh, we already start the NMPA process so expecting to be in China in 2000 middle 2024 okay uh i think the second question is uh how you are doing tapping into customized implants for uh abutment yeah, uh, as you know, um, the, um, the tolerance of uh, the surface of a power bed printing, it's not enough for uh, having screws or threads. So what we do is that uh, we have systems that we develop to um, index our printing to a milling machine and after printing, what we do is that we go and print the um, some parts, the parts where we want a bigger accuracy, uh, like threads and uh, for screwing multi-unit abutments, and then we mill it. OK, okay thank you. Uh, yeah, Martin, you can go thank first. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's another question for, um, uh, for Nicola. Um, Nicola, printing pure text and medical device part is very interesting thing. Uh, what is the maximum precision and minimum wall thickness that 3D printers can achieve? Ha, I'm happy that you noticed these interesting applications. Uh, uh, the material tungsten is a valuable 3D printing material. 
the traditional process of tungsten is actually extremely difficult um, because the tungsten has a density around 1.6 times uh, or 1.7 times uh, that of lead, I think. So it has also got the highest boiling and melting point of any element found on Earth. So um, it has got uh, excellent radiation absorption properties. It is ideal for the production of components for X-ray imaging systems. Um, that's what our customers do. So um, HPD Metal 3D printers have proven to uh, be outstanding in this case. Our customers um, are using um, uh, uh, pure tungsten for mass uh, production of 3D printed parts. Um, it, uh, all of the parts are with the uh, minimum wall thickness of merely 100 microns and an accuracy of 25 microns. The best, one of the best in the world, I think. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Uh, I think I got a new question for Emily uh, from our, one of our audiences. Uh, he says, uh, I want to know how do you design the patterns of the hip implants referring to the algorithms and uh, how do you generate these algorithms to obtain the optimum outputs? Yeah, so I mean, we're a pure coding um, technology, basically. So we use coding languages to program these algorithms. Um, however, we have built predefined building blocks that you can easily use out of the box. And on top of that, that you can create a user interface that is always very application specific. So um, there, there is an, uh, a user interface for uh, the patterning of different implants, for example. Um, and we've integrated simulation into that as well. Um, where you can then input the factors uh, where, that you want to see. So the internal stresses, for example. Um, and we're currently working on closing the feedback loop to then automatically optimize that those designs that the, the software or the algorithm uh, comes up with. OK, yeah, my questions here are finished. So do you have new questions, Martin? Uh, no, I think it's okay, and uh, we, we have already passed the, the limit of time uh, for the webinar, so um, we unfortunately will have to end the webinar here. Uh, if if um, anybody has other questions, uh, please get in touch uh, by the follow, following HBD social media on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, or leave a message through their official uh, website. We hope to see you next time in September for another webinar about Mo and Dai. Thanks again for your time. Bye bye. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Yeah. If you have questions, you can uh, contact us uh, through LinkedIn, Facebook, or our website. Oh, yeah. Thanks for your time. Thanks, our four guests. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Thank everybody. Thanks. We hope to see you in September.